We're, We're Batman, Batman at 89. Hello and welcome once again to Bat Minute 89, the show that infiltrates your inner sanctum three days a week. I am one of your hosts, John Parker. Uh, I am the other sanctum infiltrator, Niall McGowan. <laughs> Hello. Hey, how's it going, hey. John? Welcome back. Uh, and we are joined once again by very special guests. We have Mark and Nathan from the DC Cinematic Minute podcast. Hello. 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 How's it going? <laughs> hey, welcome back. I'm glad you you managed to come back and not get sick of us after five million hours recording. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's our way. <laughs> but yes, this... We still got the clock running. So. <laughs> this is minute 89. Oh. And the minute starts... Oh, oh it's 89. Hey. Oh, my God. We've made it. It's we the end of the show. could say it's bat minute 89. Woo. Oh, party time. Party time. This is going to be a fun one. But not really when you see what's happening. It's, it's not a light don't, minute. Don't make any promises uh, we can't deliver, John. <laughs> yeah. The minute itself, it starts with a child about to be murdered, and it ends with Alfred playing matchmaker once again. Oh, at least there was a nice ending from a horrible beginning. Uh, I will do uh, just in terms of housekeeping, because I meant to mention it last minute, just for the sake of like, well, we, we say we, we definitely did this. Um the Wayne Murders, because they're both dead now. Wayne Murders uh, originally occurred in Detective Comics number 33, which was published in November 1939. Uh, so there you go. That's uh, just wanted to have that little tidbit in there. I also did have a little thing about the fact that traditionally in comic books and animated versions, Thomas Wayne is almost usually drawn as been virtually identical to Bruce Wayne, except with a mustache. And I'm like... Could they not have just got Michael Keaton to put on a mustache to do the scene? <laughs> <laughs> would that would that have improved it, or would it have been like the worst decision that Tim Burton ever made? <laughs> It'd be a bit sitcommy, wouldn't it? I don't know. <laughs> That's a bit weird. Yeah, it would work maybe in a different movie, just not this movie. And it would, it would confuse people because some people would be like, "Are we forward in time now? <laughs> yeah. Is Vicky Vale being shot?" Like, I, people probably would get confused. I mean, people get confused enough with Better Call Saul when you get the flashbacks of him immediately after Breaking Bad and he's got the moustache and things. People are like, what, is this the future? Is it future or is it past? Is it Basically, is future there. or is it <laughs> past? I knew you had my reference now. <laughs> it's a, it's a Twin Peaks reference there for anyone out there who seems confused. It's been a couple of episodes since we've done a Twin Peaks reference. Well, That's good. Well, uh, step up our game. But yes, we <laughs> yeah, we are we are back at the crime scene anyway with the mystery man. He's uh, he's shot Thomas and Martha, and he's advancing on the kid. And you finally see his face. Oh, he's got a very creepy grin. This guy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Did you guys do any research on the actor who plays this part? No, but he looks like one of my friend's old roommates that actually uh, <laughs> lived down the street here for a little bit. He looks like Craig, doesn't he? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. yeah. <laughs> is is that a good thing for him or a negative thing? Are you, are you dissing him? Or? I I mean, like, he's yeah. he's in a movie. Uh, honestly, <laughs> yo, I, I like this actor. Um, if I was in a director's seat, which I don't know how to make movies, so, <laughs> you know, I'm, I have no... Uh, I'm in no position to make decisions, but this guy would have been a cool joker for a whole film. Hell yeah. Mm. I could totally yeah. see it. Like, I didn't want to say in the last minute because you know we just saw a silhouette, but even the silhouette, yeah, is like, yo, that looks like the Joker. That looks like that guy. If you took him and replaced Jack Nicholson with this guy, and he was fighting uh, Michael Keaton's Batman, I'd be like, this is a really cool combination. Mm. Yeah. No, I would. I would like to have seen that. Actually, I wish there were more scenes of this actor. Like a few more yeah. flashbacks, maybe. That would be uh, interesting. But uh, the, the, this actor himself, this is his name is Hugo Blick. Not a big actor. Uh, he appeared in uh, Black Adder Goes Forth as Lieutenant von Gerhardt. Oh, my God. No. That's him. Ah. 
<laughs> really? Because uh, I've not seen Blackout. It goes forth in years. So I was like, I don't know who that is. But clearly from your reaction, you know who Hell that yeah. is. Hell I've, I've seen, yeah. I've seen Blackout about 150,000 times. So. Oh, well, then, there wow. you go. That's, that's him. <laughs> but this guy, though, his career is interesting in that um, he's, not, he's majoritively a writer, producer, director. Uh, is big with the BBC. He, um, he has his own production company as well called Eight Rooks. And uh, he produced, he co-wrote and produced the uh, BBC comedy series, which is big, which was big in the UK, uh, Marion and Jeff. Oh, yeah, yeah. Which was the thing that kind of launched Rob Brydon, who's like one of, well, nowadays all he does is star in adverts for cruises because <laughs> that's all he can. But obviously he was in The Trip with Steve Coogan. He's a big UK comedian. Uh, and apparently he, they, that, that show that launched him was co-written by this guy. And he's also the, uh, one of the writer, producer, director for The Honorable Woman, which starred Maggie Gyllenhaal, who, of course, was in The Dark Knight. Everything's so. connected. There you go. There you go. That's good for him. I like that. I like, you know, I, I feel like that's always moving up when you go from actor to, like, writer, producer, director, and all that. Like, good for you, man. Oh, yeah. yeah. Nice work. <laughs> I do have to say, though, I think maybe a lot of his casting was like smile hairline yeah yeah there you go (laughs) that's all you need (laughs) well he he does kill it you know he's not a bad looking guy (laughs) he's a a handsome chap actually that brings up a question we've been asking a lot of guests usually female but you know we don't discriminate we've been asking if you think that jack nicholson is a sexy handsome guy or not because there's been some debate about this, because he's always portrayed as being kind of sexy. But uh, I do not mm. understand that at all <laughs> in any way. Um, do you have an opinion? Is he, is he a handsome man? Or... Does it depend on the movie? Yeah. Wow. yeah okay, I'm, see, I'm thinking like Shining kind of. And, like, and maybe some woman's into that? Or I person? Guess. <laughs> yes. Um, I wouldn't say sexy. I mean, you brought up hairline for this guy, but Jack Nicholson's king of hairline, in my opinion, and that's just like <laughs> that kind of throws attractiveness out the window, in my opinion. Now, you know. Yeah. But I, I do like Jack Nicholson. <laughs> oh, he's a, he's fantastic. We, I love him. He's just not attractive. That's the thing. Yeah, but like he, his roles, he always seems to be a kind of ladies' man. I think maybe it's he's kind of a bit. He's he's a bit sleazy. I don't know. It always comes across he's a bit creepy and yeah. weird. Oh, yeah. But yeah. then again, maybe someone's into that. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. If yeah, that's totally, your thing, totally. that's pretty. That's cool for you. But you know, that's <laughs> I, I, think, uh, I think Michael Keaton is more handsome now than he is in this film. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. Oh. Yeah, that's fair enough, actually. Does yeah, that make that, sense? That, that, that's actually a fair assessment. I, would, I, might, I may actually agree with you. I think, I he's, think he's, he's, looking pretty, hmm. he's looking pretty good these days. Uh, yeah, and... and this guy does yeah. legitimately look like a young Jack Nicholson, I think. He, he captures him very well. Yeah, yeah. Well, I suppose now, yeah. that now's the time to bring up um, what we kind of alluded to in the last minute, John. Because you were, you were saying, you know, uh, these guys are very well dressed mm. for a, mugger, a mugging. And it is kind of like, yeah, what is the deal with this? Because like, these guys are like nice suits. They don't mm. look like they're hard off. Why would they... Just go yeah, they, in for a mugging. It doesn't. They seem look like way. real gangsters. Yeah, they, they'd yeah. be mugging people. They'd be like, well, in the old days, they'd be running booze over the border or something. Yeah, <laughs> but it does, it does mm-hmm. make um, because you know there's variations on Joe Chill. Most most people now come imagine a guy, old tattered raincoat, and he's just a he's a desperate guy. Oh yeah, Joe uh, Chilton. Yes, yes. Yeah, no, <laughs> Joseph, Joseph Chilton from uh, yeah, Joseph Ch- <laughs> from yeah. the, the Newport Chiltons. <laughs> but uh, again, the, uh, and this is a thing, you know, kind of revelation I came across because um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about like how deep did Tim Burton really delve into the comics? He always had that famous quote of like, "Well, anyone who knows me knows I've never read a comic," and but it's been all put back to his actually he's got a bit of dyslexia and it's all been taken out of context and yada yada yada. And there's a lot of debate about like, well, how much was he actually into the DC comics lore? And, uh, you know, in researching this scene, I've come across, um, apparently, him and producer Julie Hickson, who also produced Homeward Bound 2, just saying. (laughs) Okay, okay. They came up with a, before Sam Hamm 
delivered his first draft. They came up with 30, what was always said to be a 30-page treatment. But it's actually uh, someone found online who's read the whole thing. 43 pages, he says. Uh, that's a bit like picky does it matter at that point if it's a few more pages <laughs> I think it's, it's more the fact that it's like oh he's more like oh it, it does exist I've got it it's exactly 43 pages uh, ah okay because there's a lot of dispute about whether this existed or not and um, yeah uh, within that though that's very much based on the Tom Mankiewicz script but one thing that Burton and Hickson included which is in the, uh, you know prevalent in this minute a thing that Sam Hamm apparently was not keen on at all is the idea that Jack Napier killed the Waynes? And I can see that being a bit of a, a bit of a big uh, divide with with people. As I know it is with fans. Yeah. Some yeah. people, even who love the movie, are like, I don't yeah. like this part. Yeah, it still is an issue. But one yeah. other thing that was in this treatment, uh, and I think we mentioned a few weeks back, uh, John, you were saying like, oh, it's it's interesting that they never get into this film. Like, why a bat specifically? Why is he dressed in this costume? In this treatment. They harken back to Detective Comics 235, uh, an issue called The First Batman, where in the lore now, that the, it was a costume party where Thomas Wayne uh, appeared dressed as essentially Batman back when you know, he was alive. And uh, oh. he was taken away to operate on a gangster called Lou Moxon. And you know, eventually he overpowered him, fought him. Lou Moxon got arrested. Sent to 10 years in prison, he gets out, hires Joe Chill to kill the Waynes. And then this goes on to be done in various kind of forms. In the Tom Mankiewicz script, originally, they had Rupert Thorne, who was running against Thomas Wayne for mayor in that script. He hires the Joker, who hires Joe Chill, who kills Ah. the Waynes. And then Tim Burton streamlined all, all this is, and it, it, he seems to it, it, him and Julie Hickson independently hearken back. They have in that treatment the whole business of like, yes, Bruce Wayne, his dad dresses as Batman essentially when he's a kid. This was a thing filmed by Alfred, this costume party, and there's actually a scene of Bruce Wayne watching his dad dress up as Batman. And then that uh, was that's pretty yeah, cool. And then all that sliced out of the movie. Then we get this. <laughs> we, all we're left with is, oh yeah, by the way, Jack Napier killed his parents. So long roundabout way. I don't know. I I, I have a I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. My my question. You brought up the the fact that um Bruce Wayne or Thomas Wayne was dressed up as a bat at, at that costume yeah, party, yeah. which he then had to had to leave. Um, was that suit? Now I can't remember. But was that suit the same one that Dr. Hurt mimicked when he tried to come back and say that he was Thomas Wayne in uh, Grant Morrison's, uh, the what was that, the Black Glove run? Oh, um, actually, I couldn't tell you. I'm not too sure at all. But the, no, I, yeah. I know of Dr. Whoops, Hurt, my bad. and I know of the bat thing and him trying to be Thomas Wayne. I know of that, so I can yeah. see. And you might be right yeah. about that one. Mm-hmm. That's one for the for the listeners. Let us know if that's yeah. correct. I mean, it sounds like a... It sounds like a very Grant Morrison thing to do. Yeah. I mean, hey, whatever. I think you've discovered Moving the truth on. there. You've, you've found out the truth. You've, you've got to the bottom of that. But I, I do think uh, find it's quite odd, though, because you know, a lot of the, you know, the, the Batman lore, though, that, that seems like I'd be a major thing that people want to mention. It's like, you know, there was a whole issue where his dad was dressed essentially as a bat and stuff. And, but that all seems to be like, you know, boiled down to like murder alleyway Batman. You know, there's no, and then a bat flew in his window this time. <laughs> As, uh, <laughs> the, 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 within the popular consciousness that seems to have sort of fallen by the wayside which is a bit shocking but um yeah, it's, so i like the mystery in this though mm. i will note as well because like, I, I, I like the writing of it the say in, in within the treatment uh that tim burton wrote when he when he's watching his dad dressed up as you know bat a, a batman it says uh the home movie also takes on a new purpose Beckoning him into some imagined reunion in the silent hereafter of the screen, as Bruce is watching it, it's like, oh, that's very poetic, Jesus. Yeah. I think. Do you think they? So, the whole Jack Napier replacing Joe Chill, is it was the intention to just kind of um, isolate the film without having to go too far into? Okay, we don't. You know, this is the first Batman film. We don't want people to get like too confused on like okay who's joe chill and like why is he why are the parents being killed and 
them saying, okay, so the person that kills his parents is actually the Joker so that they can just make this film. Um, the kind of a, a singular sort of like, that's the story done. <laughs> like he, he got revenge yeah, on yeah. this. Yeah. yeah, self-contained. Yeah. Like, is that, do you think that's like the intention or? Because there's got to be a reason to be like, oh, we've got to replace that guy. Mm. I, I'd you know? say that's definitely the reason. Because, I mean, superhero movies had been on a downward turn for a long time leading up to this. And this was sort of intended to boost them back up again after the failures of like Superman 4 and things like that. So it's like, we're going we're gonna to mm-hmm. resurrect this whole thing. So I think they were, they were really trying to hook in everybody who only knows Batman as, oh, yeah, it was that TV show, wasn't it, with that guy. They don't know anything else. Yeah. So I think they want to bring in people who have absolutely no knowledge whatsoever. Yeah. yeah. And that's the way to do it. You don't want to bamboozle yeah. them with things like... Because so you can even pick up when something's supposed to be a reference, I think, in a movie. Even if you don't know the reference, you're like, that's clearly referencing something, but I don't know. <laughs> so I think that's what they're going for. Yeah, and it doesn't... It, and as long as it doesn't like ruin the film if you don't know it, you know, mm. like... If I'm a average movie goer and I go see something and I go, I feel like they made a reference that I don't understand, but at least I can keep watching the film and forget about that because it's not detrimental to the plot or anything. Mm. Um, but like, and I think that's why Wonder Woman works so well, the film that just came out, because it's a very self-contained film and they didn't go into it going like, okay, this is a film within the DC Cinematic Universe. They said, no, this is the first Wonder Woman yeah. film. Yeah. And so they treated it as such. And so, like, if someone doesn't care about the DC Cinematic Universe, um, they can just like Wonder Woman. Like, they can just watch Wonder Woman, have no care about... I mean, they might be like, oh, cool, so Wayne Enterprises is in this universe because she gets a letter from Bruce Wayne. That's cool. And that could be the only thing you see, like, just Mm. the only film. And, like, it doesn't... It's not ruined because at no point in the film are they like, oh, yeah, don't forget... Part yeah. of Justice League, you know. I think that's why it works, though. That's why it's so good, isn't yeah. it? Because yeah, I mean, exactly. I think the DC movies need need more of that because they're. I, th- I think maybe they felt they had to play catch up a little bit, like with Marvel. Like we're gonna have to rush out this this team up film and and you know sort of launch everything as fast as possible. But I think if you if you had more standalone films first, it would have it would be better. It would it would feel more natural when you then get Justice yeah. League. Yeah. You know, it, it, <laughs> well, it, it is kind of odd in. We're going way off tangent, uh, tangent here. <laughs> yeah, we'll come but, back uh, in a minute. <laughs> but in Justice League, like my whole thing is like when they introduced Cyborg, because there's so much sort of they have to give you so much backstory on him. And it's kind of like, ah, oh, I really could have used the movie of this guy beforehand. Like it's the one you're really like, yeah, this guy needed his own story. To, but they're very much mm. like, no, you just need to get all this in now. By the way, blah, 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 Justice League. <laughs> it's like, oh, Jesus. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> I know we're the hosts of the DC Cinematic Universe, and like we got to talk about it eventually. Oh, yeah, so yeah. I don't want to, but you invited us on, so I might. I'm gonna. I'm gonna mention some things about <laughs> it. So um, <laughs> Cyborg, uh, I really like that character a lot, and in Justice League, I still really like that character a lot because I knew what he was intended to be, mm. and then they were like, he was. They were always talking up Cyborg in this film as like, oh yeah, he's like the heart of this film and whatnot and then like the movie comes out and it's like they cut a lot out of that character that they've yeah so it's unfortunate but i still like the character anyways (laughs) yeah back in this minute um we always do this the uh the 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 mystery crook i'm still not using his name his criminal pal says they need to scram and they leg it out of there and then we do we get his name revealed because he calls to him as he's desperately trying to convince himself not to shoot this kid, the uh, his friend calls to him and calls him Jack. We know who it is, baby. And he, he <laughs> heeds the advice of his comrade and they, uh, they yeah. retreat just as the uh, the cops could be there at any minute, basically. The thing is, you just said, uh, you know, desperately he convinces himself not to shoot this kid. I don't think there's any... that that That's the most chilling part of this whole thing. The most Joe chilling part of this whole thing <laughs> is that he, he is relishing this whole... Oh, yeah. That, that look in his face is like, he's like, I'm going to shoot this kid. And he's, al- he's almost... It's like he's savoring the moment of like, oh, I'm going to get him. I'm going to shoot this little 10-year-old kid right in the head. And that's really... It's like, geez, this guy is like evil. <laughs> this, is like, this, this isn't just like a mugging gone wrong. This is like, this guy is an absolute piece of work. And it's one of these things, again, like, 
us trying to trace back, like, well, what's the point of this this mugging? In that, like, these guys are quite well dressed. Is it a you know in the original draft, the Mac was script? It was a you know political hit. The, the Burton treatment had you know allusions to that kind of thing as well. This version now, all we're left with is like, yeah, well dressed gangsters mugged these people, and then as we mentioned, the uh, Joseph Chilton, he did not seem to be like, in favor of shooting them. Like he seemed really devastated when when Jack uh, actually murders the two of them. Oh yeah. So I'm thinking like the the whole scheme to me comes across as like they these two guys might have just been walking down here and Jack might have like nudged them a one nut boy that he is and been like let's go just rob these people just for fun and then what he was buying the whole time is like I just want to shoot some people this is my whole thing this is how I get my kicks I'm just going to shoot these people I'm going to shoot that kid and that's my night you know it's and it, it, it's kind of summed up in the the appearance in his face is like he just looks like this is a vindictive evil guy just relishing what he's doing and uh, yeah I totally get that. That that comes across, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. So we all agree, we all agree. It's just like a random killing. I I think this one is a random killing. I've always been in favor of the Wayne's death to be political. It should be political. Yeah. Um. But this one you can't get away from. Uh, these just are just two get bad guys in the back. Of the I, I just wanted a string of pearls. Yeah. I always I always feel like it. The story. I always f- felt like. When they get killed, it's always for um, like collusion. Yeah, like they've yeah, been set political. up. Yeah. yeah, but I always think that it shouldn't be. Oh, that it should be like even though I think the answer is that it lies in collusion, it shouldn't be. It should always be like passion. It should just be like they just got killed for no reason. You know, like like in yeah what we're covering. Yeah, yeah, so. and like Donna Justice, like yeah. there, there was no there. There should be no reason. Yeah, but like if you really look into it, it's like the Waynes were such a significant thing. It just comes down to like, does Bruce see it as political? Bruce should not see it as political. Mm-hmm. He should see it as yeah. they died for no reason. Yeah, but it really for Gotham City, they died because they were the shining beacon. They were the the protecting gate of Gotham City. Yeah, I think that's what would hurt someone's character the most. It's like having to go through life and with the idea that there is no answer, you know, you can go your whole life like, Oh, there has to be a reason my parents were killed. And like, Mm -hmm. actually, no, there's not, you know, your parents died because wrong place, wrong time. And it's like, uh, it's like a child getting cancer. Mm. It's like, didn't deserve it. Didn't ask for it. You know, nothing interfered with their life. They just got it. And it's like, Oh, that's how life is. That's messed up. Yeah. And that, like, yeah. ruins you as a person. Yeah, I think that's definitely... That's darker and sadder, isn't it? Definitely. Like, it, not that any, any murder is light. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But for no reason at all. And maybe, you know, he's he's searching yeah. for a reason this whole time, but there there isn't... There is no answer, really. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, our Batman in our movie has come to the, like... He's accepted that things the, happen yeah. for no reason at all. And it's like... And then that's how he kind of goes off <laughs> on the deep end a bit. <laughs> a bit? Well, a lot. <laughs> you guys do kind of share in Jeez. The, oh, yeah. um, <laughs> cinematic representations of Batman. Like In, in this version, we get uh, a Batman who's wholeheartedly just killing people. Just like, yep, yeah, he's fine with it. And then the, uh, the Batman versus Superman version of that is like, yeah, that times 10. It's like he's just destroying everyone around him. Doesn't care who gets, yeah. whoever, you know, if you're a criminal, that's it. You know, it doesn't matter. I don't care about your sob story of why you're here and why you're doing what you're doing. If you're in my way, you're dead, basically. Um, mm-hmm. No, yeah, he's, Nathan and I kind of agree that Batman is one of the villains in the movie. Oh, yeah. Regardless yeah. of being Batman, like, he is meant to be a villain and, like, he's, uh, you know, he accepts that he's a criminal, too. Like, he's, you know, we're criminals. That's it, you know? Um, so, yeah. yeah. Well, we, we see this criminal one last time because he, he, you know, does run away, but he says, see you around as he exits the scene, which is a chilling foreshadowing there. And uh, but then Bruce there's startled. He doesn't know how to react. But then we cut back to a shot of modern Bruce. Uh, I was going to start going into a rendition of the song Modern Love by... David Bowie, but sing modern Bruce. No, no, no bad, by all means. Put by you all through means. that. Yeah, <laughs> no. But he's, um, he is still in that sort of extremely posed 
kind of little, uh, well, pose. <laughs> There's yeah. no other way of putting it. Oh, yeah, but, he, he kind of yeah. looks like a sculpture of himself there. Mm. But it, the thing is, I, I, oh, yeah. again, though, but uh, he, he looks back at that screen of kind of like a, it's a moment of realization. He's like, this was the guy. I was like, how many times in this movie does he have to be like, that's the guy? It's like, because we thought, it was, well, what the, the the theory was way back when. Some people say that when he when he's got Napier dangling over the chemicals, the reason he's giving him that look is because he's like, this is this guy looks really familiar to me. Yeah, I don't buy that, myself. Yeah, and then obviously the you ever dance with the devil in the pale moonlight. And he has that what like that that's supposed to be the realization of this. And then even when he's like clicking off the, the pause button on this, you're assuming he already knows. He's just looking at him, going, "This is the guy who did it." But even then, now now this minute, this moment is like him, like snapping to it, like a, "Oh, it was him the whole time." And it's like, how many times do you have to come to this realization that it's this? This is the yeah. Th- this is the one. Mm. This is where he's gone. That's him. He's finally put all the clues together. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I was gonna say, as far as compelling evidence that connect these two characters, like the quote, uh, the name Jack, um, smile. Th- see, and that's I think that's got to be the, on the lowest part because, like, are we supposed to make that connection? The smile. Yeah, I think that's supposed to be like the one that's in your face. Yeah, yeah. That that can't be the most compelling. Like that can't be exhibit. I think a. that is supposed mm-hmm. to be exhibit A, but then like maybe someone in a boardroom in 1980 was thinking about this. Be like, I guess we gotta make his name Jack and have him call him Jack a couple <laughs> times in the movie. No, I just that can't be the the thing that like sells it all. Like I understand if you're gonna go with the quote or the name Jack or just something else, but the smile. Like what you're telling me that the smile that he got from the chemical plant. And like his past self, like somehow match up. Like, I, looking at this character, like he could have been anybody. Like that he could have just yeah, got he, messed up with a smile. Okay, so yeah, he's he, he, like this character is smiling. Yeah, I get that. But the smile that Jack Nicholson has is a chemical reaction. Yeah, you know, like why is that linked together? Like that that could have happened to anyone. <laughs> I'm assuming it's like that. To me, would not. It's just got to be a thing. I don't know. He's because there's been like four or five different events now that's made him pause and go, Who is this guy? I, th- I think it's just a, maybe a combination, and the smiles may be the final piece because it was the last thing he saw there in his, his flashback, his memory of the killer. And then the first thing he then sees when he snaps out of it is the grin. So he's, he's just, I think it's just sort of symbolizing he's put all of the threads together. This is just like a visual representation of that, maybe. I've, I've I've been running a kind of uh, like a half joking head cannon, but I do kind of like it as a concept as well. Is that you could argue, except in this minute when like you know the the other mugger says like oh let's go Jack like it's really solidifying like oh it is the same guy. But I've been kind of joking around like, again though. It's like oh it's half joke, it's half like I, this could work though. Is that Bruce Wayne you know so torn up about it? He's just connecting. The dots himself, like maybe Jack Napier didn't kill his parents. Maybe this is his memory now, but like, that's right, it was this guy. But it actually could have been just some guy. And he's just, he's so, so in a quest for vengeance. Like th- that phrase, like, you ever dance the devil? Like that could have been just a common phrase that, you know, criminals, like, lo- loads of people have said that just as a random known phrase. But he in his head is just like, yeah, that means it's definitely, definitely him. And he's oh, like, that'd be amazing. And he's seeing the smile. Now he's like, through the, the warped prism of memory. He's like, that smile, that hairline, that's that's the, the way he steps out of the shadow. He was a shadowy figure, and he steps out, and that's like it's almost like Bruce Wayne's piece of the guy in his head. It's like, that's right, that's what he looked like. Whereas, uh, and then like we joked about it in previous episodes, of like, well, like the next minute, he's like, the guy who killed my parents was like a short guy with a long nose, and like he looked a bit like a penguin. <laughs> and, like, and he just keeps doing it over and over. He, he, his, his thirst for revenge is never quenched. And every just came. I would love that. It's mm. not too far off. I mean, I, I feel like that might have happened in Batman stories. What was it? What are you trying to say? Like, just kind of the recognizing. Not, of- not, not, not always the crime alley bit, but I feel like that whole like. Uh, how did you explain it? Uh, now you said like prism, like the 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 way you kind of remember things and you start putting pieces that 
seem to fit, but maybe it's not. And it's mm-hmm. just making you comfortable with your yeah. resolution. Yeah. You know? maybe, Does that make sense? Maybe you just want it to be this guy. It's a bit like Memento. Yeah. Spoilers for Memento. You know, like at the, mm-hmm. at the, have you seen that? I yeah, I just I didn't want to ruin it if, if you hadn't. Listeners, if you haven't, then turn off. But um, I was like, uh, <laughs> all right, if that was watching, like, let, let anyone here recording is not watching Memento, let's stop the recording. Go watch it. If you Come haven't back. seen <laughs> Memento, only watch the first ten minutes, and you'll be all right. <laughs> well, but of course, it's that's what I was thinking. It's a bit like that. The way he just keeps doing this, he, he wants to solve it all the time and put these clues together. That would be a great thing for Batman. It's like, th- this might not be the guy. He just wants it to be the guy. He has to catch the guy who did it. Yeah. Keep doing it on loop. That'd be amazing. I need that in a story. If it's not already being done. Sounds like- um, that, there was kind of one similar in towards the end of the New 52 mm. with uh, the Joker's Endgame storyline. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. There was a Joker kind of like planted some like false pictures of him putting him in the like you know, the beginning stages of Gotham City being built and stuff. And he was known as like the yeah, pale man yeah. and yada, yada, yada. And Batman's like, no, this is crazy. Like he wasn't, he's not some immortal being. Like I fought him when he was Red Hood back in the day. Like this is the same guy. So it was kind of that battle of, you know, have I seen him before? Or is he just like this reoccurring character that's having this moniker? Oh, that, that I like yeah. it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and even in our film, it's like our Batman and some other characters like to, uh, Dis, like dismiss dismiss a lot of stuff in in place of wanting to blame a certain person yeah. for certain actions yeah blinders mm-hmm. i think it's a, one, one thing i know it never would have happened because it would always have to reach for stories and content and whatnot but i always would have had it that even the concept of joe chill didn't exist like i, I would have had it like you never knew who the smuggler was it was always a mystery that'd be good that'd be good that would that would probably mm-hmm. and the, 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 the done you know the good like the, the joe Hill story of um you know for again might as well put this in for in case some listeners aren't familiar is that the, there is an issue and it was adapted into an episode of the brave and the bold where batman finds joe chill and he reveals is like i you know you created me i am i, I batman and bruce wayne and uh, i'm your fault and then Joe Chill panics, run, gets away, and comes into a group of criminals. And he's just like, I, like, you know, I killed the, the the parents of Batman. Like, I'm I'm the reason. Like, you know, because of that, that's why he's Batman. And all the other criminals turn on him, and they kill him because they're like, you brought this on us. And they're mm-hmm. like, that that's a good story. I don't mind that, but I still would have rather had like if it was just like a, a steadfast rule in DC Comics is like you never reveal who that what that mugger was. It was just some mm. guy. It was just faceless crime. It was just, there's never a reason. There's never any kind of resolution. Mm-hmm. And then that makes kind of Batman's ongoing yeah. quest of like just battling crime. It's just like, well, he's never going to get a, a, a finality to the whole thing. It's always going to be like, I never knew who it was. It was just, this is just what I have to do now. Just I'm, I'm chip, chipping mm-hmm. away at the giant diamond wall that is crime because that's the way the things are. There was a... There was that New 52 Dark Side War where Batman gets in the Metron chair. Oh, yeah. So the identity of the Joker. Wait, what? That's it? That's it. Yeah, that yeah. is it. Like, you're supposed to figure... Like, the Joker identity is some in DC Comics that he just doesn't have No, no, no. He said, he said, who killed my... Wait. He, he asked the chair, he says... No, who who's killed, the Joker? Who killed my kill, parents? No, he says, who's the Joker? No, it yeah. says something about Joe Chill, and he says, who is Joe Chill? Oh yeah, that's right. He says, yeah. "Who is Joe Chill?" Yeah, yeah. Okay. and then he, but they don't tell you who it is. Yeah. But he, like, and but I don't know if I like that Batman yeah, learned yeah, yeah. that. But then again, know. he was a that, god at that point. Yeah. See, I don't, I don't. There's things that I don't, like this. Like you, you shouldn't have given a name to Batman's parents. Just like you should never give a name to the Joker. He mm. should just be the mm. Joker. Although you know? I think there is a miss. Uh, you've missed out a page in that where it's, uh, the computer says it's Joseph Chilton of the Newport Chiltons. That's <laughs> 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 oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Whoops. <laughs> Revise it. Um, this picture of Joker on the screen as well. If you notice, Niall, if you remember what we were talking about um, a few minutes ago, when he froze it, when he paused the video, it was a completely different picture. Oh, of that's Joker. right. Yeah, he had his yeah. eyes shut. Yeah. Yep, it's he's it's moved along during the flashback somehow to a much better, more flattering <laughs> photo. That's a bit of a, a bit of an error there, I yeah, think. That is like, what is, what, that, that's that's what post production is for. <laughs> Why didn't somebody fix that? That's weird. <laughs> Would have took two seconds to fix, yeah. but uh, yeah, I guess people don't 
often, even in post-production, they don't comb through minute by minute, second by second, frame by frame. <laughs> Again, like, we said it so many times in the show. It's just like probably somebody on the day was like, who is going to notice? No one's going to be t- picking this thing <laughs> apart to, to that level. And nope. here, here we are, <laughs> 28 years later. <laughs> uh, and then uh, Alfred arrives on the scene. And he breaks up this little like pity party that Bruce is having. It does. Like, and, uh, th- th- this is cold. This is like letting somebody in when you're like playing with your your toy trains or something. It's just so kind of <laughs> embarrassing to have to be like, here he is. This is what he does in his spare time. <laughs> I was like, dude, it's come pathetic, on. Pathetic, isn't it? Yeah, it's just really like, dude, don't tell people. Don't let them in. Like, give me a heads up that they're coming so I can clean up and stuff. You know. It's, well, plus he's brought Vicky. All right, and this is a question I have as a largely a Batman film fan who, as, as I've said before, you know, I, I play the games. I've read a few comics, but I'm not like you, Niall. I haven't got mountains of everything in the house and more. This is my thing, the movie. But this is my question. Is this some kind of golden rule he's broken by bringing Vicky in? Like, is, is it a consistent thing that people aren't allowed to be brought in to the Batcave? Because I would think it is. Yeah. As far, but he just nonchalantly just brings a guest. Like, oh, here you go. Yeah. Well, this <laughs> is, you know, uh, kind of like the, the culmination of a thing that we've been building to, you know, the, this mm. whole show is that the fact that, like, Alfred's been constantly playing matchmaker and trying to get Vicky and Bruce together. And it seems like this is his resolution. Like, he doesn't want Bruce to be Batman. He's more like, well, I'll support him, but I'm going to try to get him together with this woman so he'll just, he'll stop this craziness. And then, you know, the, the last time we saw the two of them together, there seemed to be a sour note where he was that whole, like, well, I don't want to spend my remaining years mourning the loss of friends and their sons. And it, it, he seemed very annoyed. And this, it, the look he gives Bruce here, it's kind of like, Vicky Vale's here, and he's kind of like, there, I've done it. Now, it's it's all out now. There's no, you can't hide, but like, I can't tell her who I am. And there's all this, it's like, I've laid all the cards out. You're going to have to deal with this. And this is Alfred's play. This is almost like this is his story arc is like he's want, been wanting to do this. He's been trying to coax it. And now he's just gone. Look, right. I've just laid it out bare. And, you know, whatever happens, happens kind of thing. Mm. Little playing Cupid. Yeah, hmm. yeah. And the, the look he gives Bruce is a very kind of like, yeah, what are you going to do? <laughs> kind of like a real. It, 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 yeah. It's like taunting almost <laughs> like, well. You're not going to tell me off, and you're not going to tell her to leave, yeah. are you? <laughs> I know you like her. I know you like me. So screw it. And and Bruce, he, he turns to look at them with the sharpest turn in cinematic history. Like I'm surprised he doesn't have whiplash. He, he flings around like ah, <laughs> like he's been caught doing something that I can't really discuss on the <laughs> podcast. Um, something untoward. This is one of the. the <laughs> so now you've mentioned it before, John. I think you said you when you're. Uh, in school, you made like a, a media project that had like opening credits of people turning their heads. This mm. is like you can almost yes. imagine in the opening credits of Batman, but like that head turn and then like Michael Keaton coming up underneath or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Michael Keaton, that's Batman. <laughs> oh my god, I see it now. Yeah, um, I do like this Batmobile just like looming in the background. Mm. Like that's a really cool shot right there. Now, that's good attention to detail, because I, I actually, the first couple of times I watched through the minute, I didn't notice that at all. I just assumed, oh, it's a rock. But then, yeah, I, I, I spotted it when I was going really slow. And I thought, oh, that's really cool that mm-hmm. they thought to just leave that sort of just in the background, peeking out a little bit. It just made it seem more real, like this is somewhere he actually yeah. hangs out. Although it's kind of going against what we've seen in previous minutes. Cause remember when he took Vicky back to the Batcave, he had that little sort of cake stand thing that he kept it on. And they had to lead her through the whole cave to get up to this computer bank. And now we find out, like, oh, he could have just parked right behind him. <laughs> like, there was, there's a parking spot there as well. <laughs> <laughs> and was, it, that, that makes it more seem like this whole thing was like, I want to show off the bad cave. I want to be like, hey, check out all the cool stuff I got. Look at this whole big cave. This is where I hang out. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the other Batmobile. He has multiple. Oh, that'd be, imagine that. Maybe mm. he does. He might. That'd be cool. Yeah. He's got more than one, and they're slightly different. They're for specific purposes. <laughs> it was like the the multitude of bat outfits <laughs> you get on later in this series. Of like, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's hot. Mm-hmm. Oh, gotta have put on the bat cooling suit. It's cold. Gotta put on the bat <laughs> cooling or warming suit. Or... Highly impractical. <laughs> I do like as well that although the cat is now out of the bag, so to speak. Um, you know, Vicky, she's here. 
She knows everything. She's in the back cave. But he doesn't respond to that. You know, he doesn't get mad. He doesn't ask her questions. He just rolls with it like, okay, what's important now is our relationship. Above everything else, I'm going to focus on that. We're going to discuss this. And I thought it was cool as well. As she Is she deliberately clad in white? It, like to contrast Batman black? Like, because, and she could be like a, a, the new shining light to him. Like, she is, she, yeah, she's what, like, he really should be going for, like, to, to get on with his life, yeah. to get back on track. And because he is insanely focused on his task, it, it, too much, it's affecting him. Mm -hmm. I completely I, agree. I mean, I, you want to go down that way, like, you, they're in a cave. I mean, <laughs> she's going to be the light at the end of the tunnel. Mm. And what does that look like? Just a little white dot. So, yeah. An angel or, yeah. An, you know, or like, uh, I almost said Venus, but I, you know, like she could represent that mm. or, uh, you know, Alfred may see it too. You know, that's why he brought her, you know, he's, he sees, um, the potential if he redirected his kind of, if Batman redirected his kind of, uh, purpose or mm, focus. focus, his priorities, um, that, going this way would help him more than anything ever could, you know, yeah. like re regain your humanity. And, you know, Vicky Vale dressed in all white seems to be the most, um, humane thing. I got mm -hmm. like, she, she just is the answer staring him in the face of like a better life. Yeah. Always has been, man. It's Vicky Vale. Just, just Vicky Vale or just like Vicky Vale was like, in my opinion, she was the first one to be the answer for Bruce Wayne to not be Batman. Mm -hmm. And I mean, exactly right in this minute, like you're seeing, like this is, Mark, you said it, that's the doorway out. Like mm -hmm. that is your answer, Bruce. You follow that and you can be all out of this misery and, and obsessiveness and Batman. Mm -hmm. Like that's what Bruce Wayne can do. But, you know, as a Batman fan, I know that's completely impossible because he has to be Batman. There is no Bruce Wayne mm -hmm. able to fit in there. So it's kind of just like a, like a ba friendly back and forth that I always feel. But Vicky Vale has always been, in my opinion that first uh, option for Bruce to not be Batman. I mean, some will probably argue the, the, the Mask of the Phantasm or whatever if you want to go into the no, animated thing, see, but that's always been Vicky Vale. I've always agreed when he kind of mingles with like other flawed people like Selena Kyle or Talia mm -hmm. or uh, uh, the Phantasm because it's like that makes more, um, that makes more sense. Well, yeah, it kind of does because it's like, you're a flawed individual. You don't want to stop being Batman. You don't want to stop being obsessive about your parents dying and stuff like that. Like he's a flawed character. He's not going to ever choose the right answer because he's not Superman, mm -hmm. you know, like, so it makes sense when he hangs out with Selena Kyle and, and people like that because yeah, they're damaged too. He's damaged. They live a damaged life together. Of course they have their falling outs. It never works out. It's complete misery. <laughs> like it's a Batman thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that brings up an interesting question to me then, because do you think he he should be pursuing Vicky? Like he should, in effect, change, and because it would help, it, it may save his life. To be honest, that's that's Alfred's view, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Can't. Should he do that though, yeah. or should he try and still do what? Because like, he wants to do this. Should, like even if it's going to negatively affect him, should he stick with the Batman thing? Really. It's a tough. It's a tough one, oh, really. I uh, don't really know what's right. <laughs> the, an the answer to the should he is, of course, he should pursue yeah. Vicky Vale and can't, but he doesn't <laughs> want to. I don't see. I don't. He's, he's choosing just, not to because he doesn't want to. It's not even a one. It's not even a choice, in my opinion. Like he. Just, oh, I think he, he wants. can't. No, no, uh, no, 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 no. Batman. <laughs> like we'll go back to it. Bruce Wayne died in Crime Alley. Yeah, yeah. There is no getting past that. Bruce Wayne's dead. Bruce Wayne's gone. There is no more Bruce Wayne. There is a shadow and a mask of what this human being can portray himself as. But should he be pursuing Vicky Vale? Absolutely. Can he? Of course not. And will he? Absolutely not. There's always mm -hmm. going to be something. Alfred's in his own little delusional world that he thinks he could save this child that died when he was 10 years old, but that's never going to happen. Because you weren't there, man. You yeah, exactly. Like, there is no going back from that. Should he pursue Vicky Vale? Of course. Can he? No. Oh, that's really <laughs> sad. We're, gonna, we're coming to the end on a downer. <laughs> hey, Bat Batman's a sad character, man. I like tragedy. I'm cynical as hell. Oh, and sorry. at the same time, <laughs> Alfred 
there there should never be a, a forfeiture of either character. Mm-hmm. Uh, Alfred should always keep trying to do what he's doing in this minute, and Bruce Wayne should just keep being Batman, and they should always have that kind of conflict, yeah. that, that tug and pull of like, hey, I want you to get your life fixed. And he's like, I don't want to fix my life, Mom. And yeah. it's like, they just keep doing that. <laughs> yeah. Also, Batman is definitely a, uh, you know, it's a performance. It's it's tragedy. It's it's comedy and tragedy. It's drama. Batman has always been just the basis of yeah. drama. There's no getting past that. So it is the pull and push. Mm-hmm. Because we have like a solid minute of Vicky and Bruce action. Oh, uh, save it. Coming up. <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of like, well, should we wrap up this episode? Is this, is this, yeah, we... Well, there's one last thing she does. She says, tell me if I'm crazy, but that wasn't just another night for either of us, was it? I mean, we both got to each other, didn't we? And I was, does she mean them sleeping together and they got to each other like on an emotional level? Or does she mean like about Batman? Her interaction with Batman the, the, rescuing. The, yeah, the night they, they spent together yeah, or, in costume. Or both. Because, yeah. <laughs> I mean, going back to that date night, it wasn't that magical. Like, it, it was... <laughs> well, you, you didn't see what they did when the camera was off. Yeah, but this is more like, well, he took him into Alfred. For, or he took her into Alfred for a yeah. bit. I mean, we don't know how charming he was. But, um, yeah, that's a good question. I think it's probably both. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's probably meant to be a little bit of both. Because they, mm-hmm. she could play on words. She got to him as a as a person that's what the, the nugget of a person that's hidden underneath there still somewhere. But then, but then there is yeah. There's the whole Batman angle as well. It's it, oh, it's a strange one to work out. I, I think definitely she means the two things at once. That works for me. Before we do go though, would you like to tell our listeners where they can find you and your great show online? Yeah, absolutely. You can find both Mark and myself uh, online at DCEU Minute. That is where we do our DC Cinematic Minute podcast. Um, You can find us on Facebook, uh, Twitter, all those things, all those jazz, DCEU Minute. And uh, is that it? I think that's it. Yeah, DC Cinematic Minute Listener Society on Facebook and all that good stuff. Yep. Search the internet. Use the internet. <laughs> it's there for you. Do it. Do it. And, and do it for us as well. Like, we, we won't tell you our stuff all the time. Just Google us. We'll come up. Bat Minute 89. There you go. <laughs> I bet make sure to check out the DC Cinematic Minute because that's all great stuff as well. And we will be back on Friday where we will have a minute 90. We're all the way at minute 90. So see you then. Next time, a visit from Vicky. As our rampaging Revenger remembers who ripped his family asunder, will Bruce's butler perform a major Batcave blunder? Find out Friday, same Bat Pod, different Bat Minute. <laughs> <laughs>